here with 78 Fight News and um, obviously you're Steve Lopes, the president of the, um, the Hall of Fame. Um, yes. Yeah, so we shoot, let's get straight into it, man. Um, so Steve, man, how's things been going, man? How's things going in the Hall of Fame and that? The Hall of Fame is going very well. The Hall of Fame is at the Luxor Hotel, which is in Las Vegas. And there's a big sports attraction called SCORE, S-C-O-R-E. It has a big, big space where there are many Halls of Fame in one area. The Baseball Hall of Fame, football, basketball, soccer, hockey, and NASCAR. That's the, you know, the uh, uh, Automobile Hall of Fame. And part of that is the, is the Boxing Hall of Fame. We have a small area, like the others, but the choice was getting a big area in one of the hotels, which is very difficult to do, or getting a small area next to baseball, football, basketball to show all of the fans that come in that Muhammad Ali and Joe Lewis and Jack Dempsey are just as good and just as great as the players in football and basketball and soccer. So we have a wonderful space. The, the interesting thing is that we have a Facebook page, Boxing Hall of Fame Las Vegas, and the, the action on it is phenomenal. In the 15 months that we've been up, we now have over 50,000 likes which is incredible because now we have more likes than the Basketball Hall of Fame, the Soccer Hall of Fame, the Hockey Hall of Fame, NASCAR, and we're halfway to baseball and football. So it's, it's been very pleasing to watch the action, and the reason is that all of the materials we have, the photographs and the video, people talk about, they want to see. They haven't seen shots of Mike Tyson and Joe Lewis and Muhammad Ali, the video, the still, so it's going very well. Yeah, man, I'm, 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 I'm a part of it. I've, I've joined um, the group on Facebook as well, and, and recently I saw um, the footage of, the rare footage of um, Sugar Ray Robertson as a welterweight, um, just before he moved up to challenge Jake LaMotta, um, the footage you put out. And I've, I've never yeah. seen that before. Like, you, you're getting footage that has never been seen before. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> well, the, the company I worked for, for about 25 years it was a company called Big Fights in New York City. And it was the company of Bill Caton and Jim Jacobs, the, the managers of Mike Tyson. And the company, their business was purchasing fight films and licensing them throughout the world. From 1950 on, they would buy the films of Lewis and Dempsey and Marciano and then Ali and then Tyson and lease them to television. That was my job for many years to edit the films and in doing so, they, they accumulated some incredibly rare films because that was their business. And one of them was that film you saw of Robinson against the guy named Bobby Dykes. Yeah. Uh, in 1950, it was just the infancy, the infancy of the process of being able to record a film off of TV. That's exactly what they did. There was very little, no videotape back then. And what they actually did was when an event or fight or baseball game or even TV show was on air, they filmed the front of the TV set, which is pretty uh, archaic today, you know, but that's the way they did it. Yes. And what you saw with Robinson was a film of the TV set. Wow. That's really, it was amazing. I mean, I mean, like, when I saw that footage, it was like, it just, just, because you know, like, everyone was talking, there's no footage of him basically as a world weight. But that was like, you know, that's as, that's as best you can get. You could kind of see what, he, what how good he was, you know? Yeah, yes, there's very little. There were a couple of home movies hmm. uh, in 47, 48 against um, Angad and Riccio and Beckett, some of those fights. And then there was a pretty complete version of Robinson defending the title in 1950, I believe. I forgot the year, against Charlie Fuseri. It was a, he was an average fighter, and Robinson let him go the distance. It was a, a fund fight. It was an exhibition, a, a fundraiser for the Milk Fund back then. It was a, a fund in New York. So that's the other film, but very little of Robinson as a welterweight. Mm, definitely, definitely. Like, I used, you, you mentioned it, Bill Kenton and, and Jim Jacobs. Um, the two of them, like, uh, together, like, um, I mean, the history of boxing, what they what they know uh, is, is, you know, like, because I remember Jim Jacobs, he was the one who obviously, yeah, you said it with all the films, and, and Bill Caton, he managed loads of fighters, uh, Jose Torres and, 
and all that and obviously they're from the cat skills from obviously uh, cast the Marto days and you're from the cast um the customer i was gonna say how did you get in did, how did you was you a fighter yourself and you that's how you became in, into the mix well the joke is the joke is that i was a boxer for three years mm -hmm. but i had to stop because i had trouble with my hands the referee kept stepping on them what do you mean you kept getting knocked out Yes. Oh. <laughs> so, so, the, so that's the joke. The referee kept stepping on my hand, so it was too painful. I had to stop. No. The, the, Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton yeah. were in New York City. Their company was in New York City. And Customato had his training camp in upstate New York. Yeah. Jim Jacobs was a national handball champion. That's a sport almost like squash or racquetball, but you use your hands. Yeah. And I was a junior national handball champion. I met Jim playing handball. He had the company with the fight films. I asked him for a job there, and that's how that began. As the years went by, that was 1973, both he and Bill Caton began managing fighters. And at the same time, Cus D'Amato had the training camp in upstate New York. Uh, Cus and Jim were very close because Cus and Jim realized that for a boxer, as strange as it sounds, the emotions of a fighter are just the same as the emotions of a baseball player or soccer player. They get nervous. Hmm. Most people don't see that or think that a fighter could get nervous or have emotions, but each one does. And so Jim Jacobs and, and Customato realized they, they understood the, the psyche of a fighter. Uh, Jim and Bill were funding, they were paying the bills for the training camp in upstate New York, and fighters would come and go. And uh, Cus would get a kid and say to Jim and Bill, hey, I got a terrific kid, he's gonna be something. And Jim and Bill would say, great Cus, thanks very much, let us know what happens. And 99% of the time, the kid would not make it. And then in 1980, uh, Cus called and said, hey, I got a kid, he's gonna be something. And Jim and Bill said, great Cus, get back to us. That kid was Mike Tyson. Mm. So uh, in the 70s and early 80s, Jim and Bill, while Mike was a, uh, an amateur, Jim and Bill managed some terrific fighters that came to them. The first was Wilfred Benitez, who was a triple crown champion in the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. Then Edwin Rosario, who was a sensational fighter uh, in, the, in the late 70s, early 80s. And they were managing those fighters while Mike was becoming a, a, an accomplished amateur. But that was a relationship. Jim and Bill in New York City at their big fights company and Customato in Catskill. Okay, wow, man. Yeah, man, it's great. Seventy-eight. you got answer for Steve? Question for Steve? Oh, uh, yeah. How you doing today, Steve? Terrific. How are you? Uh, pretty good. 78 Sports TV. Um, I remember watching a documentary. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but I remember you talking, sharing a story about how uh, when Mike Tyson was a contender um, and then when he became the youngest heavyweight champion in history, he was still actually living with you. Can you go back to that story for us? Sure. Uh, in, in late 84, uh, Mike was going to turn pro after the Olympics. And uh, he had hurt his hand, though, and he had to postpone that uh, debut. And when he hurt his hand, we had a very famous hand doctor in New York, uh, a, a, a customado, asked Mike to go for two weeks to New York City to have hand therapy. And Mike uh, stayed in my apartment for the two weeks, and that's when we became pretty good friends. Uh, when Mike turned pro, Cus permitted Mike one day off in between fights, since they were so close together. That's about all the time Mike had. And uh, Cus asked me, Steve, if it's okay, can Mike come down and stay in your apartment for that one day? I said, absolutely, yes. As the weeks and months went by, Mike, of course, was uh, sleeping on the couch. I had the bedroom because I, I was paying the rent. And um, uh, as the weeks and months went by, he was a four-round fighter, six-round fighter, eight-round fighter, ten-round fighter. And then one day, I came out of my bedroom, and there on the couch is the heavyweight champion of the world. <laughs> and, and you can imagine what that, what that would feel like. It would be like having a young David Beckham sleeping on your couch. You know, everyone would go, holy mackerel, you know. And he wasn't just the heavyweight champion. He was the youngest heavyweight champion of all time, an explosive knockout puncher. And it was a long time ago, most people remember the bad Mike Tyson, the period of 1989 mm -hmm. through 2000, the, the ear biting and his conduct, of course, the rape conviction 
But back then in 84, 85, 86, 87, Mike was huge and hugely popular, doing commercials on network television for Pepsi-Cola, Nintendo film, Kodak film, Nintendo video. He was hired by the New York City Police Department to be their spokesperson. Big posters all over New York City with a big picture of Mike saying, it takes a bigger man than me to be a New York City police officer. He, did, um, uh, he was hired by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Drug Enforcement Administration to do a commercial on TV to keep kids off drugs. And the European Associated Press in 1987 voted him the world's most popular athlete. Actually, he was tied with, with um, uh, Diego Maradona, this great legendary soccer player. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, Mike was voted the world's most popular athlete, not the best athlete, not even the best boxer, most popular. That's how big he was back then because of the people around him. Customato, Caton, Jacobs, the friends Mike had in New York. The people around him had tremendous character, very high, solid character. But once he got away from that, once Don King took him over, that was very different. So for me, having Mike live with me, even when he won the heavyweight championship, he still slept on the couch. He had no car, didn't want one, no jewelry. He didn't even have clothes. I mean, he, he stayed in my apartment. I would, I would wash my clothes and put on my underwear, and they were all stretched out. I say, Mike, man, get your own underwear. He said, nah, I don't want to spend any money, you know. And the reason he didn't want to buy things, or the reason he didn't want to spend any money, was it was a simple one. When I went to work in the day, there was no fights, and he would relax. He would invite over women and entertain them, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So if a guy can have the woman he wants entertaining during the day over and over, there's no need to impress anybody, to get cars or jewelry, which I used to do to impress women, mm -hmm. and it didn't work. But he was the happiest kid in the world. When you look at his face back then in every video, every interview, his eyes were sparkling, sparkling. And his demeanor was almost pristine. That's why he was hired by those companies. But of course, Don didn't want that type of demeanor. And that all changed in, in 89 when, when Mike went off. Hmm. Uh, I also want to ask you, uh, I appreciate that story. I want to ask you, um, you know, like you, you went into it a little bit about how Mike is perceived, how he was perceived. It's kind of changing now, but he was perceived for a while as a villain, a monster, blah, blah, blah. But I remember, uh, like you said, in the 80s, uh, he was always a compassionate. Even after he would knock a guy out and go check on him, make sure he was okay, uh, he was. Uh, he seemed to have a, a friendly nature about him. And um, how, what, how exactly did Mike end up with um, Don King? Because I, me, my personal belief is that Mike started fighting differently once Kevin Rooney uh, left the picture, but can you go, if you know anything about that, could you explain how he got with Don King and how Kevin Rooney ended up leaving? Yes, it's a very, if this was a Hollywood movie, people would say it's not possible. The, the beginning was, of course, in 84, 85, 86, 87, Mike is fighting the history you know, custom motto, youngest head boy champion, commercials on TV, spokesperson for the happiest kid in the world. In late 87, he, he says, you know, he's dating women, uh, incredibly beautiful women, Suzette Charles, Miss America, Naomi Campbell, the superstar model, yeah. Robin Givens. And one day uh, in late 87, uh, he, he called me and he said, Steve, uh, what do you think if I marry Robin? I knew Mike deep down would have loved to have a family and kids and be you know, more secure. And I thought it would be more, uh, give him a stable uh, a feeling, a stable mindset. He'd be happier, better fighter. I said, Mike, that's great. What I didn't know is that Robin told him she's pregnant with, with his baby. And that same day, Robin's mother called uh, Bill Kate and Jim Jacobs and said, I demand that Mike marry Robin. So that was the beginning. Of course, Robin lied about being pregnant and just to marry Mike. Uh, and the question became, some people say, well, she was very, very well-to-do, Robin. She was on a TV show head of the class making tens of thousands of dollars a week, what does she need Mike Tyson's money for? And a buddy of mine in New York, a police officer said, Steve, it's very simple. Mike was making serious money, the type of money people kill for. So Robin and her mother, who had no character or conscience, 
it was easy pickings. She said she was pregnant. They got married. It's 1988. Uh, we fight the uh, Holmes fight. We fight the uh, Tubbs fight. Come back. She loses the baby magically. No doctor ever came forward to say she was pregnant or not. The summer of 88 becomes a horror story with her trying to break the contract with Bill Caton so she can take over Mike because there was tons and tens of millions of dollars to be made. And then the funniest thing happened. Don King, behind her back, gave Mike a contract to sign to be his exclusive promoter. Don knew that if uh, Robin could break Mike away, why shouldn't he take advantage of Mike also? Mike, being the dutiful husband, gave the contract to Robin and said, hey, Don gave me this. You, It's your business. You do what you want to do with it. She gave it to her attorneys, and her attorneys reported back to her that if Mike signs this contract, Don will be able to steal every buck Mike makes. So what did Robin do? She went back to Bill Caton, renegotiated the agreement, had Mike apologize to Bill, and rehired Bill to be the, the manager. Mm. Then it gets worse. October 1988, the famous Barbara Walters show where Robin puts Mike on to tell the world that he's manic depressive and that he hits her and he does all this crazy stuff. And I'm looking at that and I'm saying, well, why didn't he act like this in my apartment for year after year after year? And the craziest thing he ever said to me, under tremendous pressure of being the youngest heavyweight champion, the, the craziest thing he ever said was, Steve, how come you ate up all the vanilla ice cream? And, and that was it. Hmm. So I knew Mike. I knew that she was torturing him for the specific reason to put him on a public stage so that once he announced that he was manic depressive, which he did on the show, that very shortly she can file for a divorce. Mike already said he is manic depressive, he's crazy. So it would be easy for her. And the next day after the Barbara Walters show, Mike's friends told him on the phone that, she, I, I can't pronounce the word too, too well, she dissed you, Mike, she, she dissed you. She did really bad stuff by having you on the show. We know you're not crazy. Mike and Robin had a big fight. They broke up. Mike came back to our office the following day to say, hey, guys, I'm so sorry for putting you through this all this stuff with, with her and the lawyers. Bill Caton was completely compassionate. He knew, number one, Mike wasn't crazy. He said, Mike, the first thing we have to do to you, you're not crazy, because I know you're not, and Steve knows you're not. I'm bringing in the world's most famous psychiatrist tomorrow. I guarantee he'll be here, you come over too. Mike comes the next day, psychiatrist shows up, Dr. Abraham Halpern, an incredibly well-known psychiatrist, brings Mike into a room for a couple hours to talk to him, comes back upstairs, and the psychiatrist says, Mike is fine. He's very unhappy about what's going down, but all he needs to do is get back to fighting in his regular routine. Who said he's manic depressive? And Bill said, well, Robin had a, a doctor at, here in New York City who, who, who started giving Mike this very, very dangerous chemical called lithium to keep Mike under control. And in the office, Abraham Halpin said, get this doctor on the phone. I want to speak to him. Bill King gets his doctor, McCurtis, from New York Hospital on the phone. Abraham Halpin gets on. Of course, we can only hear Abraham Halpin's side of the conversation. Dr. Halpin says, uh, Dr. McCurtis? Yes, this is Abraham Halpern here. Yes, that's right, Abraham Halpern. So obviously McCurtis said, holy mackerel, mm -hmm. Abraham Halpern. Uh, Dr. McCurtis, um, you prescribed lithium to, to Mike because of his being manic depressive? Is that your diagnosis? That wasn't your diagnosis. So why did you prescribe lithium? You didn't prescribe lithium. Uh, Robin Givens got all these crazy things going on behind the scenes. Wow. Now, the biggest mistake made was mine. We had this conversation with Mike in the office with Bill. Once Mike knew that he wasn't crazy, Bill said, Mike, I'm going to get you more fights. We have a fight planned with Alison Rodriguez in, in Argentina, I think, or some South American country, then Bruno, and then uh, Lennox, all these great, oh, Van der Holy, all these fights lined up. Mike was thrilled. And, and Mike turned to Bill and said, can you get me more commercials on TV? Bill said, absolutely yes, Mike. We're going to get you more commercials. Mike was thrilled, and he walked out of the office. That was my mistake. My mistake was I didn't understand that Mike was still in pain 
from the Robin Givens episode. The next day, or two days later, Don King grabbed him, brought him to Cleveland, got him laid 44 times a day, took his mind off Robin Givens, and a week later, Mike calls and says, hey, Steve, I'm here in Cleveland. I'll, I'll, I'll be back in a couple of weeks. I said, great. Two weeks later, Mike calls and says, you know, I've been thinking about my career, Steve. I'll call you next week, okay? Two weeks later, Steve, uh, get Bill to send me all my contracts. And it was over. Mike and me, my mistake was letting Mike leave the office, not knowing that he was in emotional pain. What I should have done was, as Mike was walking out the Bill's office, I should have said, Mike, uh, wait up by the elevator for one minute. He'd say, sure, okay, I'll be downstairs. I walked back to Bill King and I said, uh, Bill, uh, cash a check for me, I need $100,000. He said, well, what for? I said, I want to take Mike down to Rio de Janeiro, get him laid 44 times a day, <laughs> take his mind take his mind off Robin Gibbons. He said, Steve, he'd say, what are you talking about? Bill, Mike is in pain right now. Mm. I know how I would feel if the woman of my dreams, I thought were my dreams, did this to me, I'd be dying. So I know he's hurting. If we don't do this, someone else will. Yeah. That's exactly what Don did. Took Mike's mind off Robin Givens. Within three weeks, Mike was asking for his contracts, and it was all over. Don knew, Don is actually a brilliant con man, that he knew that once Mike started the ball rolling against Bill, that Mike would never back up and say he made a mistake. He didn't do that in 89, 90, 91, 92. He goes to prison for the rape, comes out, goes back to Don in 95, 96, 97. Half a billion dollars of Mike's money gone, reputation gone, all of Mike's accountants gone, all of his advisors gone, all of his lawyers. Everyone around Mike was a Don King guy. And it's interesting that uh, I was on the Larry King show. Do you guys get Larry King yeah, show over there? Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Oh, okay. I was on Larry King's show in 1992 as Mike was in the uh, a case in Indiana for the rape. And before he went in, I was on, and they asked me about Mike's career. And I put a lot of the blame on, on Don King. And uh, a caller, they were taking calls, and a caller came in. Uh, I didn't know if the guy was black or white, but it really didn't matter. And he said, you know, Steve, sounds like, um, you know, um, you, know uh, you guys are just jealous that Mike went with Don. I was hoping for that call. I was praying for that call. And I said to the, the guy calling in, I want to thank the, the caller for calling in because that's a very important question. Let me answer it like this. If Don had taken Mike away and made Mike a better fighter, got Mike more championships, got Mike more commercials on TV for Pepsi Cola and Nintendo Video, got Mike more spokesperson roles for the police department, the FBI, the DEA, all of the things that Bill Kate and Jim Jacobs did, if Don did that, I'd take off my hat to him and say, Don, holy mackerel, I thought Kate and Jacobs did a great job. You surpassed that, congratulations. But that's not what happened, I told the caller. What happened was Don took Mike away, surrounded him with creatures of the night, the, the scum of the earth. Mike's demeanor slowly, calculatingly, went back to a street mentality. Don knew that would happen. Mike's commercial endorsement's gone. Mike's spokesperson role's gone. Mike's reputation in the world gone, going from the world's most popular athlete to the most unpopular celebrity in the world. I'm not jealous at Don King. I'm angry that he took this kid, this sensational fighter, my friend, and destroyed him. So that's what I did on Larry King Live, and the same thing holds true today. That's what Don did to Mike. If it was just the money, if Don just stole a half a billion dollars like he did, but Mike's reputation in the world was still pristine. I'd say, hey, Mike, Mike wouldn't even care because you can imagine how it would feel. You're a, you're a, a, a hero doing commercial on TV. Everywhere you go, Mike, we love you. You're, you know, we love you. Newspapers, you know, everything is positive. It feels pretty good. For me, it would feel pretty good. I'm sure for 99% of the world, it would feel pretty good. Hmm. Now imagine that everywhere you go, people recognize you, like they do with Mike. Having that people come up to you is wonderful. But once your reputation is shot and you do horrible things, everywhere you go, people know who you are. It's a lot different. You go in to buy a, 
a cup of tea in the morning and the person behind the counter says, oh yeah, Mike Tyson. And you can hear the mumble, piece of junk, junk mother thunder. That hurts everywhere you go. Every newspaper you open up, Mike Tyson bum, Mike Tyson loser, Mike Tyson demeanor. Every interview on TV, newscasters, people talking, being a hero going to that is very painful. So that's what bothered me the most, and I can tell you that's what bothered Mike the most. Not the money, but the reputation. Definitely. Um, I'd like to say, like, would you say with the pillars of, of the people around, like you said, um, when um, uh, Customato passed away, Jim Jacobs passed away, and, you know, the people, them sort of people as well, obviously, you, you know, you, you became a strain for Mike as well. Would you say because of that as well? That's a tough question to answer. That's a good question. Because Mike was so solid when Cus passed away, and he was so solid when Jim passed away, because he did fight the Spinks fight mm -hmm. under tremendous pressure, and I'll tell you a story about that in a second. I think, and, and I was on the, uh, you know, Mike was pretty solid. It wasn't until Robin started that horrible ball rolling against Mike with the drugs and everything else that that caused that. If it wasn't for Robin, I think Mike would have been solid. And I'll, I'll tell you why I think that. While Robin wanted to get rid of Bill very drastically because she couldn't steal all of Mike's money if Bill was putting it in the bank. The, the day before the Sphinx fight in Atlantic City in 1988, it was the biggest fight in the history of the world. Uh, Mike had a friend, a man named Rory Holloway, his close friend, and Rory wanted to start a t-shirt business. And Bill Caton was a master of marketing, advertising. So Mike called Bill the day before the fight and said, you know, Bill, I'm here with Rory. He'd like to start a t-shirt business. Any possibility you can meet with Rory anytime to talk to him about that? Bill said, Mike, anytime you want, I will help him 100%. And Mike said, can we come over now to, the, to your, uh, uh, your room at the hotel? Bill said, absolutely. They go over. Uh, Bill tells Rory Holloway, Rory, I'm going to help you in every step of the way. I'll work with you on the designs. I'll work with you on the examples. I'll work with you in getting you in to speak with these huge department stores. Back then it was Macy's and Gimbel's. And I'll, handle, I'll work with you every step of the way to make this a success. And Rory said, wow, that's great. And Mike said, Bill... I thank you so much. You know, what part of this do you want? What percentage? Bill said, Mike, this is for you and Rory. I don't need anything. I don't want anything. It's yours. And Mike said, wow, Bill, thank you so much. The next night at ringside, on the HBO camera, the HBO camera was on Bill Kane at ringside, and the announcer says, we've just been informed that Bill Kane has been given a lawsuit subpoena by Robin Gibbons' attorney, to break the Mike Tyson contract. Now, I know Mike pretty well. There's no way he can go to Bill Caton's room the day before the fight and ask Bill for his help, knowing he's going to be suing him the next day. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of evil machinations that were happening behind the scenes. I'm sure Robin didn't even know that that was happening. But that's the way Mike was with Bill to that point. It all ended when Robin, that summer of 88, rejuvenated a little while when Robin found out about Don King, but that was how solid he was to that point. Without Cuss, without Jim, Mike was pretty good under that tremendous pressure of the Spinks fight, at that time the biggest fight in the history of the world. So I think Mike would have been fine until he met Robin Givens and Don King. Okay. Well, you said you was going to say another little story? Yes. Um, I was having a little bit of trouble with, with Robin. I have to admit, I was calling her names uh, to other people behind the scenes during the, the Sphinx time period from uh, May to June of, of 1988. Uh, she knew this. She had heard it from people. And she was kind of under control until one day she just burst out and said, Steve, you're fired. And I said, well, let's see about that. Hmm. And that day, actually, um, Mike, uh, she was yelling at me and screaming at me and uh, on the phone. And she said, I'm going to get my husband to kick you in the freaking ass and bust your head. And I said, oh, gee, I don't. Two minutes later, the phone rings. And it's Kevin Rooney. And he says, Steve, uh, 
Mike just got off the phone with Robin. There was yelling and screaming. I said, I know. She just called me. Are you guys headed back here now? Yes, we are. I said, okay, you know, I have to talk to Mike. And just, did he understand, you know, that really nothing really transpired? I, I, he, and Kevin Rooney said, I understand. Kevin comes up to the room. Two minutes later, Mike walks in, walks right past me into his own bedroom. Wow. Closes the door. Well, at least I know he didn't punch me in the nose, okay? <laughs> then on the phone, I can hear him yelling and screaming to Robin. Stay out of our business. You don't know anything what's going on here. Don't bother us. Don't bother us. Stay out of our business. Well, at least I knew that there was Mike being strength, and he knew that whatever I did, it wasn't something that would hurt him. A minute later, he walks out of his uh, bedroom, leaves the front door to leave the apartment. I said, well, at least he didn't punch me again. And then 10 seconds later, he comes in and says, Steve, come on, let's go for a walk. If Jennifer Lopez had asked me to go for a walk, it would not have been as important to me as Mike Tyson saying, let's go for a walk. So we start walking and she, he starts to say, hey, Steve, she probably scared you when she started yelling at you, right? I said, Mike, you don't understand. It was like I was shaking. He said, Steve, come on, man. I was shaking too the first time she yelled at me, but you know, you're my brother, man. Forget it. I said, Mike, I really appreciate that. Thank you. But that was before all the junk hit the fan. Mike was still solid. Once again, if it hadn't been for Robin, the summer of 88, the pregnancy, Mike would have gone down right there with Ali and Joe Lewis. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he was on. He was on the cusp, definitely, definitely. I, I only remember the good things about Mike, to be honest with you, because um, I was listening to one of your interview uh, you had online with uh, some other guys, and, and to be honest with you, I'm not, I'm not gonna too go much into the ear biting, and I just want to talk about because I'm, for me, I remember Mike Tyson when I was younger, like 15, and all the Nintendo games, I was playing all the games, and all, I was up ITV obviously in London, and all the fights were coming early in the morning. I saw the Bruno fights. And you know, um, you know, I saw all the fights, but you know, for me, it's the it's, it's, it's the Buster Douglas thing really bothers me. Like we had an interview with um, Doctor Fernie Facheco, and he he's saying for the life of me that he didn't understand that the punches he was landing on uh, Buster Douglas, that that Buster Douglas could take them total punches, but and then he was wondering why how come Buster Douglas could take them punches and Mike Mike could uh, you know Mike could, was it because of the training? Is it because of Kevin Rooney and the whole thing, or his mindset? What'd you say? That's a great question also. A couple of things. Once again, uh, you're, you're, a, uh, you're on TV, you're an actor, or you're, you're conducting, a, you're a radio uh, interviewer and you conduct radio interviews. Okay. If everything in your life is great, your wife is great, your kids are great, you just got a raise, you had your, your doctor examine you, everything is terrific with your, uh, with your uh, health, you just got an uh, Emmy Award, an award from England, you go on that day on, on the camera, behind the desk, on the, in the set to, be inter to interview your first guest, you feel terrific. But if you're not doing well, if your company has told you you're gonna be fired in two weeks, they cut your salary, your doctor told you you have cancer, your wife is having a miscarriage, somebody stole your car, on the set that day, when you interview the other person, you're not gonna feel so good. Now imagine if you're an athlete on a stage, even a soccer player. When they go on the field, if they're feeling great, that's fine. But if they're not, that's going to affect them too. All depends on your, on your makeup. Now with Mike, there are some boxers it would not have affected. But Mike is very, very emotional. So for the Douglas fight, he left Bill Caton. He knows he made a horrible mistake. Millions of dollars are being taken from him. Uh, that he knows behind the scenes, that his paydays. He lo loses his commercial endorsements. His, his demeanor starts to change. Uh, Don King fires Kevin Rooney. Mike knows that he left Bill, he left me. The training process, I don't know what had transpired over there, but obviously it wasn't strong enough. Now, Mike fights the fight. He goes back to his corner for the first couple of rounds. He's not doing well. He sits down and he starts to dwell. And dwell, I mean, it's almost like a tennis match. When the point is over and one player walks to the other side of the court to get ready for service, in that six or eight or 10 seconds, your mind goes to a different place for a moment. 
maybe your mom, your dad, your car, your girlfriend. For a split second, it, it goes. Then you get up ready to serve, and you're back on track. That happens in football and baseball and soccer. Maybe there's a timeout. The mind dwells. In boxing, it's in the corner when the guy sits down. Usually, for Mike, in 85, 86, 87, 80, 88, he sits down the corner in a tough fight, maybe the Tucker fight. He looks up at Kevin Rooney. You know, he's thinking in his mind, you know, boy, this guy Tucker is pretty good. And then all of a sudden Mike says to himself, wait a second. I'm the heavyweight champion in the world. I got Kevin Rooney. I got Caton. I got Jacobs. I'm doing commercials on TV. I'm a hero. I'm a superstar. I'm going to beat this guy. He gives himself every reason to win. Gets up, has just as much firepower in round 12 as he has in round 1. Now it's the Douglas fight. Comes back to his corner, let's say, in round 4 or 5. Sits down. Oh, shit, man. I got these jerk-offs around me. They don't even have an end swell. They got this big water bag. <laughs> man, I, all my, my money's being taken by King. The presser on my butt. I dumped Steve. I dumped Kevin. Man, I wish I had Kevin here. He gets up for that round. There's a lack of there's less energy, less emotional energy, less emotional strength that he takes with him. Round seven, round eight, he scores that. Now it gets really weird. In round eight, he scores that tremendous one-punch uppercut that yeah. knocks Douglas down. Yeah. Douglas is on the canvas. The referee is counting. Too one, young. The count two, can't get too well, young. You know, well, he took a long, but here's where it gets interesting. Yeah. One, two, three. Now, you're right. Douglas should have stayed down. The whole count, whatever it was. Mm. And the press the next day would have said to Mike, Mike, it was a tough fight, but you scored a knockout. Congratulations. Count is five, six, seven. Once again, Douglas should have stayed down. And the fight would have been over. Mike, tough fight. Congratulations. Maybe next time. Eight, nine. Douglas, remember, I don't know if you remember, Douglas is pounding on the canvas. He was trying to decide whether to get up or not. He was struggling mentally. Nine. Nine and three quarters. Douglas gets up at 9.999. Whether it was a real 9.9 .9 or 15 sec, he got up. The next round, he beats up Mike. And round uh, uh, 10, he knocks Mike out. And what that was, in, in a strange way, it's almost mystical, when Douglas was on the canvas, it was almost like the powers above looked down on Mike and said, Mike, in the old days, 84, 85, 86, 87, Everything that could go right for you went right, but no more. Now you're going to see what happens when you're when you do the wrong stuff. You want to you want to go with King and Robin. Now watch what happens. Douglas gets up and knocks him out, and that's so amazing because from '84 to '88, every possible thing that could go right for Mike, everything he said, everything he did, everything that Customato did and Caton and Jacobs went right. Once he went to Robin and Don King, every single thing that could go wrong went wrong. Every fight, the knockout, the rape, the ear biting, his demeanor, the press, the no commercial, every single thing, because it has to do with the people around you. So when Mike was drilled by Cuss to be that type of character, he emulated Cuss and then Jim and Bill. But once he got to Don King, Don King carefully, calculatingly put guys around Mike. Mike knew, even in 84, 85, 86, he knew how to act like a street punk. He didn't forget that. But it was too much fun being a hero. What Don did brilliantly was put him back in the street mentality. And Don knew that he would never go back to Bill when he was thinking like that. And it was that's the way it worked out. Wow. Okay, um, I can, like, Don King... Um, what I can't understand <clears throat> is how he would get rid of Kevin Rooney. Okay, it seems almost like, and you correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like he wanted to remove all of the positive influences around Mike. Would that be a fair statement? Yes. And a little bit more than that. You brought up an excellent point, which I forgot. A little bit more than that. Let's suppose, or back in 1988, and by the way, Mike never fired Kevin Rooney. What happened was Don King had been paying off a newspaper writer, a guy named Mike Marley, to write articles for him and his uh, uh, company. And he had Mike Marley write an article that said, 
Mike Tyson fires Kevin Rooney for certain statements, whatever they were. Mike never fired Kevin Rooney. But Don knew that once that was in the paper, that people would go up to Mike's, the guys around Mike, Don King's cronies, would go up to Mike and say, that was a good move, Mike. What do you need Kevin for? The reason Don did not want Kevin around, Don really didn't care if Mike was not as good as he was. He was good enough. It was critical for Don to do one thing and one thing only, steal Mike's money. Now, if Kevin was around Mike, what would happen was Kevin would be the trainer. After the fight's over, uh, the checks would be given out, and Don King would give my, uh, Kevin his check for, for the trainer's fee. And Kevin would look at the check. Let's say there was the first fight. Let's say it was the, the Bruno fight, which was in Atlantic City. Um, it was in Las Vegas in 1988 was the first fight without, without us. Kevin would look at the check. It would be like, you know, a, a, a $200,000 check. And Kevin would say, what's this? And uh, Don King would say, well, Mike made $2 million bucks and you get 10%. And Kevin would say, but this fight should have been a $10 million fight for, for Mike. $5 million from HBO, $5 million from the site, foreign sales. It's got to be at least the last thing Don wanted was someone around Mike going up to Mike and saying, Mike, you should have got three times this amount of money. That could never stay with Don. There was no way he'd permit Kevin around or me or anyone like that to say stuff like that to Mike because it would cause a huge furor behind the scenes. Don didn't want that. Okay, so I get it now. So you're saying Kevin Rooney, as a trainer, gets paid a percentage of Mike's purse so he would know how much he would get paid. So Don had to remove him so that he could steal Mike's money without uh, any outside influences. Exactly. Every, like say about 90% of the time, 95%, a trainer gets a percentage of the fighter's money. Usually it's 10%. So, but, you know, if a fighter is supposed to make $3,000, but he only makes 2700 the trainer, instead of getting $300, gets two hundred seventy. dollars it's really not a big deal. But with Mike Tyson, if he's supposed to get $8 million and only makes $2 million, the trainer, Kevin Rooney, knew that the purses that Mike was making with Bill Caton were enormous purses, especially the Sphinx fight before was the biggest purse in the history of boxing, $21 million. So Kevin, getting his 10%, was said, Mike, you should have made at least $8 million in this fight. Where's the other $6 million? So there's no way that uh, uh, a Don would permit anyone around Mike, me or Bill or Kevin, to see any of those paperwork because they would go to Mike and say, where's the rest of the money? All of Mike's attorneys were Don's attorneys. All of Mike's accountants were Don's accountants. All of Mike's managers, Rory and Holloway and John Orr, were Don's guys. So Don had to have complete control. And that's, uh, that's uh, what they call not a con job. It's, it's, oh, it's called isolating the mark. In the, in the movies, the mark is the guy or woman you want to take advantage of. If they're surrounded by good people or their own friends, it's very difficult to take advantage of them because they're being given advice by people who care about them. But if you isolate the mark, if you get the mark away from those people and put people around them that you control, now you've isolated the mark, it's much easier to take advantage of them, whether it's money or stocks or bonds or companies, anything. And what Don did brilliantly was isolate the mark, and that was Mike. Wow, um, <laughs> what you just said there, it, 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 I can see it. It's, it's, it sounds it sounds like candy from a baby. But let me let me go back a bit further. So see the Teddy Atlas situation with Mike, like, and this is this is my question leading up to it. See the influence with Teddy because I remember Teddy had an interview. I don't know if he was around. Yeah, I think he was around. He was around that time. So Teddy obviously the influence with Mike was disrespecting his niece or stuff like that, and that situation with the gun. Would you say that you know the people? You know, very dis the strong disappearance, um, dis yeah, disappearance that people around Mike from a very young age, and because Mike Tyson, I know Mike Tyson, you know, he's he, he's uh he's complicit in a lot of these things that happen. I know, you know, he's being manipulated, but he, would you say it's, it's just the the people around him from a very young age, because God, because I remember Teddy was saying he should have went to school and 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 um and Custer was letting him get away with it. Like, can you go into that little thing from early from in, in his teens? 
Sure. Another great point you brought up, I would have forgot all about it. The incident with uh, uh, Mike and Denise and, and, and Teddy. Let's take Teddy's side for a second about that the incident happened exactly like it did, and it was horrible. And Teddy goes to uh, Carson and says, you got to get rid of Mike because he's no good and he's never going to develop and it's all this horrible stuff. And Cus said to Teddy, Teddy, I understand how horrible this was. It was horrible. I will speak to Mike. I'm sure that he'll understand that it was horrible, that he'll apologize to you. Uh, he won't do it again. But I know, kids, you have to give him a chance. And Teddy said, forget it. He's got to go. He'll never be good. There's no way either he goes or I go. And Cus said, Teddy, uh, I've been around a while. I, I, I think he's going to get better. I know he's going to get better. I can't say anything more. And Teddy said goodbye. Now, if Teddy was correct that Mike's discipline was a factor, then in 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, Mike would have shown it over that six-year time period. He would have done horrible things, acted out horrible ways, all the things that Teddy predicted. But that's not what happened. Cust knew that a kid like Mike, a street thug, a bum off the street, had to have some time to develop. And Cust was right. 84, Mike was fine. 85, he turns pro, no problems. 86, becomes the youngest heavyweight champion of the world. And perhaps, maybe, I'm not a great historian, under more pressure than any other athlete in history, being the youngest heavyweight champion of all time. And, and, and remember now, in, in soccer, you can lose three games and still win the league. Yeah. In baseball, you can strike out four times and still hit the game-winning home run. In every sport, except boxing, one punch, the ball game is over. Mm -hmm. And you're, the whole team rolled up and won. And Mike was the youngest heavyweight champion of all time. Doing tremendous in 87, commercials on TV, loved and adored, police department ads, FBI. Now, if Teddy was correct, none of that stuff would happen. But Teddy has never gone back and acknowledged that because it's a little embarrassing to think that he was wrong. The cost had been around for 70 years. He knew that that kid would have developed well, and Cost was right. Mm. Okay, uh, I, I want to ask you, um, what, like we talked to uh, the fight doctor, Freddy Pacheco, and he had some you know, pretty harsh words for Mike uh, when we asked him how Mike would do uh, in the era of Ali and Foreman and uh, Frazier and all those guys. Uh, Pacheco said that it's disrespectful um, to even mention Mike with those guys. He said that Mike knocked out, he was knocking out all bums. Now, I want to get your opinion on this uh, because, you know, he, this is Mike beat. He unified the heavyweight title, okay, and he's fighting top contenders all the time. How, I don't understand how people say he fought bums because he demolished them. Can, can you respond to that? Yes, interesting topic. Uh, it's interesting that all you can do as a heavyweight champ is fight everyone who's there. And the question becomes, you know, how do you do with them? So Mike fought against whoever was around at that time. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the fights that went the distance were, of course, the Tillis fight, which was his first 10-rounder. Then the Bone Crusher Smith fight, which was 12 rounds. Uh, then the uh, uh, Tucker fight, which went 12 rounds. Uh, I really don't go into after 88 because that was the Don King era. So during that time period, Mike had some, some 12 rounders, which were, you know, um, he didn't look that great. But he won almost every minute of every round. Now let's look back at Ali in, 80, in 64, 65, 66. During his prime, I don't look at after the war because that's not the real Ali. Against, he went 15 rounds with uh, Ernie Terrell who never threw a punch in the fight. He got dropped by Sonny Banks, a 175-pound fighter, uh, the year before he won the title. He got rocked by Carl Mildenberger, a southpaw who chased him out of the ring. He got rocked by Zora Foley. He got rocked by Billy Daniels. He ran from a 54-year-old Archie Moore in their fight. Uh, he ran from a Floyd Patterson in 65 who couldn't even walk, he had a bad back. Now, Ali won all those fights, but in some of those fights, he looked really bad, average. As a matter of fact, if you turn off, and this is a trick for, for deciding who's exciting and who can really fight, the trick is 
you put on a fight, let's say Muhammad Ali, you turn off the sound, and you put on the, the, uh, the Ernie Terrell fight. You turn off the sound, and you suspend your knowledge that one is Ali and one fighter is Terrell, and you watch the fight. And you say, after a round, this is nothing's happening here. This guy's running and running. Yeah, he can punch, but there's nothing happening. And you put on the Carl Mildenberger fight with Ali, turn off the sound, it's not Ali. Boy, this guy's getting chased out of the ring by this guy. I don't know who these fighters are, but it's a pretty boring fight. And the same thing with Patterson. And the same thing with Foley. You'd say, holy mackerel, this old guy is chasing him around. With Tyson, he's winning, moving forward every step of the way. Never took a backward step, winning every moment of the fights. And in some of the fights, you know, Burbick and, and Thomas and Biggs and Holmes, and he's blowing guys out. You say, holy mackerel, this guy, honey, don't bother me. I want to watch this kid fight. So it comes down to you can only fight who's in that era. But a lot of the guys that Ali fought, Mike would have blown out. You know, 54-year-old Archie Moore, uh, Terrell, those guys, which chasing Ali, it really wasn't even fair. You know, Brian London and those guys with, with Mike. Now the question becomes Mike and, and, uh, and Ali, man to man. And it's interesting that the type of fighter that bothered Mike the most, or I should say the type of fighter that Mike could knock out, could not knock out quickly was the tall guys who moved a little bit. Tillis, Smith, uh, uh, Tucker, you know, 10 rounds, 12 rounds, 12 rounds. But Mike won every minute of every round going forward chasing the other guys. Now look at Ali. The type of fighter he didn't like fighting or he looked poor against were the shorter guys coming in. The Sonny Banks, the, the Daniels, the uh, Carl Mildenbergers, the Zora Foley's, even Floyd Patterson who couldn't even walk, chased him around, chased him around. So the Crazy. difference is Mike winning every minute of every round against guys who were tall, but Ali getting rocked and dropped by guys, oh, I forgot, Henry Cooper, your guy. <laughs> dropping Ali before he fought for the title. Chasing him out, I mean, he rocked Ali. Now, Cooper was a, a terrific fighter, but he wasn't a Joe Frazier, and he wasn't, you know, a, a, a Jack Dempsey. A mate. I don't think he was a, a Mike Tyson. But he rocked, he dropped Ali. You know, Ali, good thing was at the end of the round. So the type of fighter Ali didn't like was fighting that short guy coming in throwing bombs. And Ali got hit, and he got hit often, pulling back and dropping his hand. So it would have made an interesting fight. My pick would have been the first time they fought, Ali would win. He'd win a decision. Mike would be very, very emotional. He'd be very nervous. He wouldn't be himself. The fight's over, and Mike would watch the videos and see, well, Ali really didn't do anything. He hit and moved. He didn't really catch me. Really, he's not a great puncher. The rematch is in three months. The rematch, I pick Mike big time. He'd come in there winging shots, knowing there was no firepower coming back. And Ali dropping his hands and hand, chin up in the air, I, I give uh, Mike the edge after that. But it, neither guy is going to have a tough, easy time with the other guy. Mike's type of fight bothered Ali. Ali's type of fight bothered Mike. Wow. <laughs> as a good assessment, as good, as good as any, as good as any. So let's, let me have this argument, because, let me uh, have this conversation with you. Let's go to the pound for pound conversation. I remember Bill Caton and I remember Burt Sugar sitting around the table discussing the pound for pound. So they had Henry Armstrong, they had Muhammad Ali, and they had Sugar Robertson. Would you concur with with obviously? Would you concur with that assessment, or would you put anyone else in there? Well, I like to break it up a little further. There is the mo uh, there are a couple of categories which are very key, and that is pound for pound is one. Then there is most famous fighter of all time, then most beloved fighter of all time, and then most exciting fighter of all time. Those are the four. The pound for pound, since you brought it up first, I would put Duran and maybe Sugar Ray Leonard right up there with Robinson as pound for pound. For most famous fighter of all time, I, I'd have to go with Ali because I think there'd be very few guys more famous. Most beloved is Joe Lewis because as much as people like Ali now, they forget that during the war era, he was hated and despised because of his stance against the Vietnam War. Even though he was vindicated, he was hated. And, you know, so Lewis fighting for his country and giving his money up for the army during World War II, I think he's more beloved. Most exciting. That's a tough one. But I make it a, a toss-up between, like, Tyson 
and there was a fighter in the 60s who was absolutely phenomenal named Fighting Harada, Masashiko Fighting Harada from Japan, and Aaron Pryor, when Aaron was really coming out bombing. Wow. So those four groups, I, I would split up. You know, pound for pound is key, but Duran may not have been the most exciting fighter of all time. He definitely is not the most famous, and he's definitely not the most beloved. You know, Even in the Latino audience, Latino audience, I think the, the edge might go to Chavez you know, for that whole era. You know, so But pound for pound, I, I like Duran for pound for pound. Wow. <laughs> well, this, this, this is probably one of the best um, conversations I've ever had. Um, well, Chris, have you, yeah. ever, any other questions? Um, well, yeah, I just want to concur with that. I, I really enjoyed this uh, conversation. This is good, good knowledge here. Um, what do you think of current boxers uh, uh, today? Um, uh, you have Floyd Mayweather out there. You have Manny Pacquiao, two very popular fighters uh, that haven't been able to get into the ring because of a lot of politics. Um, uh, how do you feel about that situation? Well, uh, you know, Pacquiao is a very exciting fighter. Once again, I use that analogy. If you put a fighter on a screen, you turn off the sound, you suspend your knowledge of who the fighter is, he comes out and there's action, you know. Floyd is like watching paint dry. Unless the guy's in there pushing him, he's absolutely boring. There's nothing happening. You turn off the sound and you watch the fight. You watching? And you watch, and it's like, holy mackerel, you know, it's like, and people forget that, yeah, he's very popular now, and he's a champion, but he's much like a Roy Jones type of fighter, or a Bernard Hopkins type of fighter, that there's nothing happening on the screen. Now, for some reason, the public gravitates toward watching those big fights, you know, he only fights twice a year, and they're big fights, but they're not exciting, you know, if Duran was around today, 140 pound Duran, and you told him you got to fight, uh, uh, you know Mayweather. He'd say, okay. And the only problem, with, you know, Roberto, is you get 77 million dollars. The so the spit, the saliva would be coming out of his mouth, <laughs> and he'd say, he'd say, he'd say, do we have to wait for the fight? Can we fight tonight? And the same thing, you know, Tommy Hearns would have blown him out. Hagler, forget it. But Mayweather wouldn't even show up. You know, those guys were just vicious fighters. Tommy Hearns vicious guys you know and there's nobody around like that today it was a big disappointment with canelo you figure the, the the opportunity of his lifetime to do something even if you go out getting knocked out you want to put on a show you no know, mayweather's up there i told the promoters of uh, pacquiao that what they should do is put out a press release that says pacquiao will fight mayweather winner take all i'd like mayweather's guys to come up and hey man it's great you can win the whole thing and you'd hear Mayweather say, well, you know, I don't think I should fight, and the guy's on drug. I don't think he wants to fight him. And the reason is, it's a very smart reason. Mayweather is absolutely wealthy, independently wealthy. He never has to fight again. So he's thinking, okay, in his own mind, he's thinking, okay, I can make the fight. You know, make a little less, but I can make the fight. But wait a second. If I win, yeah, I become a little more famous, and I make a little more money. But heck, if I lose... My whole reputation goes out the window. Hmm, what do I have to gain and what do I have to lose? It's not worth it for him. Pacquiao, screw it, I'll, I'll fight anybody anytime. Get me the fight, you can tell by his demeanor. You know, That doesn't mean Mayweather's not brave, but he's smart. He's smart, he's got a huge ego. Well, I don't have to tell you that. Any guy who goes on TV with the 77 cars and all the jewelry has gotta be some type of egomaniac, you know? So. That's what I think, is that he does not want to fight the fight. Will it happen? Maybe. Maybe at some point Mayweather will say, you know what, I'm a champion, I'm going to get in the ring against, I want to prove to everyone I can do this. Let's see what happens. Yeah. What would you say about, um, this, this, this is look like you mentioned just slightly, about the drug testing, and, and, and recently, I don't know, like, um, a lot of fighters have come out, and, and Mike's come out, so a lot of fighters have been taking drugs. Um, Let's let's talk about Mike specifically. Did you know? Uh, is this this art me oxen? Do you know that if Mike took any any performance harnessing in drugs, um, you know to to enhance his performance? Yeah, I, I thought he didn't need to, but like me, what you have to say about it? Well, of course, after '88 when he left, I don't know what he did, obviously. Mm -hmm. But from '84 to '88, he had trouble reminding himself to take vitamins, or if he was a had a had a cold to take penicillin. He you know, if I went to Mike 
you know, and, and uh, said to Mike, hey, Mike, you know, we're going to do some drugs back, you know, this good. He looked at me and said, Steve, man, what are you, out of your mind? What do I need that stuff for, you know? I'll tell you, he had so much pride being a champion. Of course, you know, the drug testing was very, very um, uh, severe in uh, Las Vegas and in, in Atlantic City when he had the, the huge fights here. Uh, he had so much pride in being a champion that there was no way that he'd do anything to make that go away. In, in Las Vegas, I remember one, one time, I think it was the Pinkland Thomas fight in May, and I, I, we had a huge entourage with us. Two people, <laughs> me and Kevin Rooney. That was it with Mike. You know, so you see these guys with Mayweather coming mm -hmm. with 66 people and everything. It was me, Kevin, and Mike in the house in Vegas. I did everything. Did the cooking, the cleaning, the shopping. I was the, the, I was the wife there. So uh, w I'm washing Mike's underwear, washing Mike's clothes, washing Mike's uh, workout stuff. And one night I go into Mike's room to put his stuff away for the next day. So he has clean, clean stuff. And it's not that late, maybe about 10 o'clock. And uh, the door's halfway ajar, and I open it up. It's dark in the room, but the light shines on the bed. He's not there. I'm saying, what the, what the hell is this? He, but I hear some noise from the other side of the bed. And I walk around. He's doing sit-ups in the dark. Ooh. I say to myself, oh, man, I don't want to be the other guy. <laughs> I don't want to be the other guy in the ring. You know, that's the type of the discipline during that time period. If he was getting in shape four weeks before a fight, I'd be eating in the kitchen. 10 feet from his room, I'd be eating ice cream, this great ice cream. And I hear his door open up, and he comes over, sits down next to me. He hadn't eaten all day. I see a big black hand come over. He touches the ice cream with his finger, puts it in his mouth, tastes it, and walks away. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd take the whole bowl with me if I was him, you know? But that's the type of discipline he had. So to do drugs, if I had even mentioned that to him, he'd say, or Kevin Rooney, forget it. Kevin would say, Steve, are you out of mind? But once he left, I don't know. I don't know. But something else is that, in my opinion, there's no drugs you can give a fighter that would make him fight any better. If a fighter gets hit on the chin, the ball game is over. There's no drugs you can give a fighter that would make him fight any faster or make him fight any bigger or make him fight any stronger. It doesn't exist. In 12 rounds in 45 minutes, you don't need. If you're running a marathon for three hours, that's different. That's different. I don't know. Maybe you can take something to keep from cramping up. In boxing, you know, it's interesting. A guy may be fighting and he looks very, very, very tired in round six or seven or eight, and all of a sudden he lands a big shot and rocks the other guy, and he opens up with 10, 12 punches really quick. Where did he get that energy from? Where he got it was emotional psychological. He saw the end of the fight and that pumped them up. That's what gets a fighter up and going, not the drugs. There's nothing you can give a fighter to, in between rounds to make them fight any better. Nothing. So, you see that bit with Aaron Pryor bit against Lector Grail when uh, Panama Lewis gave him some drink and all of a sudden they said like, yeah, give him the one, give him the drink, the one that's mixed. So, you don't think, he said that the drink opened up his lungs and stuff like that. That What do you have to say about that? Bullshit. <laughs> it sounds good. You know, by the way, the, the craziest thing is that they only permit you water in the corner. Yeah. If a guy wants to drink Pepsi Cola or orange juice, who cares? Mm. They're going to test him anyway after the fight. They yeah. tested prior. There was nothing in his, in his urine. Mm. If a guy wants to drink, you know, a Kool-Aid or, or, or beer, let him drink. Who cares what he wants to drink? It won't help. It doesn't help, you know. Mm. There are fighters who got sick in their fights without drinking any stuff, you know, they got sick and can't fight. If the guy wants to drink it, that's his problem. By the way, he could have drank, had it in the locker room 20 minutes before. Mm. You know, if the guy wants to drink, you know, Pepsi Cola or, or you know, Hagen dazs or ice cream, who cares? Mm. It doesn't help. It may, if it, 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 he could get a, a stomach ache, that's his problem, you know? Mm. That's the Duran No Moss thing, you know? <laughs> yeah, and you know, he's another thing as well. Was you a photographer as well? Because I remember in Japan, Tokyo, Japan, when when you uh, you was you was around when when Mike first went to Japan. I think it was against um, T Tony T and Tops. Were you there? Or that? Yeah, you, yeah. You, the, the photographs is in them times. Like oh, it was like I remember because I still remember ITV and they were sharing Mike, and it was less crazy. Like and they in Japan, they love Mike over there. And do you remember like you know? How the whole thing was when you went to Japan with Mike and that the first time? 
Yeah, it was sensational. It was insane. From the moment we got off the plane, they were incredible people. They treated Mike royally. He was an absolute superstar. And so many funny things happened over there. The very first day, there was a huge press conference. Mike's up at the desk, the, the dais, uh, answering questions. And, of course, all the questions are in uh, Japanese, and there's a, an interpreter to tell Mike what the English is. And the first guy gets up and says a question. First press man gets up and asks a question in Japan, Japanese. Interpreter tells Mike, Mike, how's the trip? And Mike answers. Next guy gets up, question in Japanese. Interpreter asks Mike the question. Mike answers. Third guy gets up in Japanese. And as he's talking, Mike turns to me and says, nobody speaks English. <laughs> was, I said, Mike, it's Japan, man. He said, Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, you know. So they, they, it was that everything there was sensational. Mm. Uh, it was getting used to the time factor because the fight with Tubbs took place at ten o'clock in the morning there to be ten o'clock in the evening here. Uh, the only problem for Mike was Robin and he had just gotten married a few weeks before, mm. and there was that stuff happening behind the scenes. I, you know, and it was the first time. I think that Mike, actually there were a couple of times when Mike put me under such pressure that I wish I was customado, and that was one of them. About a week before the fight, Robin had been out there for a few days, went back, and one night we had the, we had the whole floor of this new Otani hotel. Our doors were open since we there were guards out in the main area where no one can get in. And I'm watching TV one night, sitting on the edge of my bed, and Mike comes in and sits down next to me. And I said, Dan, this is, this is weird. I said, yo, man, what's up? And he sh hangs his head. He says, Steve, it's Robin. She's, just, I mean, she's driving me crazy. I should never have gotten married. I'm going, oh, in my mind, oh, no. I got the heavyweight champion of the world a few days before his defense with Tony Tubbs. On the eve, three months, four months later, fighting the biggest fight in the history of boxing against Spinks. And here he is, distraught, disheveled, emotional. I said, oh, man, what the hell do I do? Whenever I was in a position like that, which happened once before, I never say to myself, Steve, what, would you, what, what do you do? I say, what would Jim Jacobs do? No, no, better yet, Bill Cade, no, no, I got it. What would Custom Motto do right now? And when I thought like that, it clears my brain a little bit, gives me a little more non-emotional answer, more rational. So I look at him and I say, what's happening? He said, Steve, she's driving me crazy. I, I don't know what to do. I said, Mike, look, first of all, number one, the fight in, in, in Friday night, you're going to look sensational against this guy. You're going to score a sensational knockout. I guarantee it. You're going to look great. And when we get back to New York, everything with Robin's going to work out 100%. He says, you mean it? I said, Mike, have I ever been wrong before? <laughs> he says, no. Mike, you're going to knock out this guy, and we get back to New York, everything's going to be fantastic. He says, okay, and he leaves. And, of course, he knocked out Tony Tubbs. Yeah. But Robin, oh, boy, was I wrong. Yeah. But I had to get him through that time period. The only other time that was like that was even more pressure-packed. In, in Las Vegas, our very first trip out there was against a guy named Alfonso Ratliff. Big guy, not very good fighter, but a perfect opponent for the undercard of Spinks Tengstad, who was Mike's fight before he fought uh, Burbick. First day in the gym, very famous Johnny Toko's gym in, in, in Las Vegas. We're training, maybe four rounds of sparring. Uh, Kevin says, that's enough. Mike walks in the dressing room. Uh, I start to pack up my camera equipment. Kevin comes out. He says, we got a problem. What's that? Mike doesn't like it here. He wants to go home. I said, you're kidding. He said, no, he wants to go home. I said, yeah, but we got the fight in, in eight days. It's a huge fight. He says, Steve, he wants to go home. I said, okay, let's see what I do. Once again, I start walking the 30 feet to the locker room. What do I do? No, no, no. Jim, no. Bill, no. Cuss. What would Cuss do right Because I have to do that. Otherwise, I'd, I'd be shaking to my boots, you know. I walk in there. I said, yo, man, what's up? He says, I don't like it here. I want to go home. I said, why? He said, I don't like it here. I want to go home. I said, okay, look, Mike, I, you know what? I don't like it here either. I wish I was back in New York. But I guarantee you this. Number one, you're going to knock this guy out. You're going to be the superstar of the show. You're going to be a superstar. People go bananas over you in the fight. That's number one. Number two, if you don't want to come back here anymore, we don't come back here anymore. He said, you mean it? I'm telling you. If you don't want to come back here anymore, we don't come back. 
He said, okay. That was it. Wow. Uh, but I tell you, when you have the most valuable sports personality of all time, and you're under that pressure. Mm. Now, you know, now I know that, you know, Beckham was big, but not as big as Mike worldwide. No. And Michael Jordan is big, but not when Mike was Mike. I, you know, a funny thing happened. Um, we were at the National Sporting Club in England. In uh, 1987, Mike was given an award there as Fighter of the Year. And we got there. It was a wonderful time. And we're at the dinner. And who was there from the who? Roger Daltrey was one of the guests. And at the halftime, at the intermission in the show, the MC said, ladies and gentlemen, it was a room probably about maybe 500 people, 600 people. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to get autographs from any of our guests, please feel, 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 feel free to do so. And uh, people lined up with Daltrey's autograph and Mike's autograph. And Daltrey's line was maybe 100, 150 people. Mike's line went out the door. I don't know. They were downstairs and around the corner. Wow. That's the way he was back then, that huge, huge mm. thing. But when you mentioned the fight in Japan, the Tubbs fight, mm. that was a, a new arena they had there that they just built. It was called the Egg, the Big Egg. It was built a late 87 to open in early 88, and they had a difficult choice to make. They wanted to announce the arena to the world with some event that the world would look at and say, wow, there's a new arena. So they had a choice. They had Michael Jackson, Madonna, Bruce Springsteen, the Rolling Stones, one other group I forgot, or Mike Tyson. <laughs> Guess who they picked? Mike. Mike. <laughs> they knew that the world would be watching that event. That was the one that, now can you imagine being voted over that? That's the type of drawing power, the type of power he had back then and that's what bothered me when he was taken over by King that all that left him you know I'm fine because I can walk down the street and no one knows what I've done or what I've said but with Mike it bothered him for for a decade and but fortunately now he's back he's got wonderful people around him his wife Kiki and uh, he's doing incredibly well interestingly enough the spectrum of his life is so unique that you know once again I'm not a historian but from Mike, from where Mike was in Brooklyn, a punk, to where he went in 86, 87 as the world's most popular athlete, commercial on TV, back down in 94, 5, 6, rape conviction, ear biting, all that stuff, and now back up again to this huge spotlight, the book, the tour, TV shows, out. I don't know anybody in the world, in the history of the planet, that had that type of spectrum. You know, it's so immense. And he's handling it. And I'll tell you, the pressure on him now is enormous. Interviews and, tr and, and uh, personality tours and TV and newspapers and phoners and the one-man show and the book tours. I don't know how he does it, but that's the athletic, that's the championship quality in him that says, I can do it. You know, that's the real Mike. Yeah, definitely. I think people, to be honest with you, just love to like Mike. I think it was all about him. I mean, if you, like you said, it was the people around him, like, to be honest with you, people in London, when he, obviously, uh, um, if you know that, when he came over here to fight one of our fighters in um, he fought in Manchester, and because we never had him in the 80s, we still remember in the 80s, so when he came over, he got flocked so much in Brixton that they, they put him into, into a into a police station just to keep the fans from, from you know, it was, it, the fans obviously, was just, it, we was, it was like scenes from the 80s, people just, just loved Mike. So, you know, I'm not, like, obviously, he, if he was around all them, them, them bad influences, he, them sort of things would happen. But people, I think, generally in the people in the world still have a good good impression of Mike. I mean, even though all the things was happening to him and what he's been through, I think generally people still like him. Yeah, you know, uh, I think that, especially in, 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 in England, mm -hmm. you know, he, he was always loved and adored by yeah. the fans. And he, he knows that, and even here in the United States, if he was around people, i give an example. Even though he broke away from me and Bill, around 1990, maybe even after the Douglas fight, he knew my whole family, Mike, because, uh, you know, they visited us in Las Vegas, and they were at ringside, and he hung with them and everything. He knew my whole family. And uh, in, in Los Angeles, around 1990, uh, my uncle was living there, and he knew Mike pretty well. And my uncle went to a TV show. 
and there's a big parking lot, and it's getting dark out, and my uncle parks his car and uh, walks to the stage, the entry to the stage, and as he's walking, it's dark out, but he sees these two big black guys coming at him, and he's wondering who they are, and as they get closer, he realizes it's Mike Tyson and some, another guy, and he looks at Mike, and he says, Mike? And Mike goes, Uncle Marty? Hey, what are you doing here? And Mike, Marty says, I'm going to a show, and, and Mike says, no, no, come with us, you know? That's the way he really is. Mm. When no one's around, and he could be his real person, if he's, whether it's in a crowd, he, he loves people. He was told there's a, a boxing guy here in Vegas, a man named Gene Kilroy, who was with Ali uh, for many, many years. And he told Mike, look, the problem you have with a lot of people is when they stop asking you for your autograph, or they stop loving you. That's when you have a problem. That's when you should be unhappy. And Mike realized he was right. You know. The actors or actresses mm. who are upset that people want their autographs, they, they should know what it's like to live on the street. You know, <laughs> I don't know about, you know, they really, I, you know, you like to smack some of them saying, you know, I need, I need my free time, free time. Yeah. That comes with making 20 million bucks a, a film. You want free time? Move, you know, move to uh, the Pacific Ocean on some deserted island somewhere, you know. So for fighters, the ones who don't want to do anything for the public, they're, they're I mean, and there have got to be guys like that in baseball and football and basketball and soccer and every sport. But Mike, he knew that the fans were very special and he treated them like that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I agree. So let's let's talk about um, let's talk about um, you uh, you the president of the Hall of Fame. I, I, that, that, how long have you been president for? Well, the company I worked with, Big Fights, that owned all the fight films. Yeah. Uh, in 1998, it was sold to ESPN as part of the deal. Bill Caden and I always, and Jim Jacobs, always wanted to build a new boxing hall of fame, something that was very special, something that focused only on the fighters, not the promoters, not the managers, not the spit bucket men, not the trainers, because without the fighters, there'll be no promoters or matchmakers or managers or spit bucket men. So Jim and Bill and I always wanted to do a boxing hall of fame. Once the company was sold to ESPN, Bill I promised me that if he sells the company, part of the rights that we need for the Hall of Fame will stay with us, and ESPN will get the TV rights. They weren't thrilled with that because when they paid $73 million for the company, they wanted everything. Mm. But Bill said to them, hey, if you want the TV rights, we keep the Hall of Fame rights. Mm. And, and he kept them and said, Steve, I promised you we'd keep them, we got them. Mm. So for years, we tried to do a Hall of Fame, which was something that we wanted very much, but it was a tough sell to the casinos. The casinos were really the only place for it because it gets very high traffic flow. And people will be able to see the, the exhibits, they'll be able to see the fighters. It'd be very tough to get something going in a town outside of some big city. That would be very difficult to do, and it wouldn't serve the purpose. It was very difficult. The casinos were very difficult to deal with. Space is incredibly difficult to get in casinos in Las Vegas. But eventually we met a developer here in Las Vegas who was building this incredible sports attraction and it gave us the opportunity to put a Hall of Fame in there. Even though Bill died in, in 2004, his son Brian and I have been trying to work on this for many years. We had the opportunity and for me it was something where many people said you could never ever do a boxing Hall of Fame. It won't happen. I said okay let's see. I accumulated a very large library of memorabilia so that the films, while they're big and very big, we needed also stuff to put in there. And once this developer spoke with us and said, I've got a space, it's not a big space for you guys, but it's a space, and you could be next to baseball, football, basketball, we said yes. So we struck a deal, built a Hall of Fame, a very small space, but on the strip in Las Vegas. I know that uh, you know there are other halls of fame. If they had the opportunity to be on the strip, you know whether it's uh, hockey or anything like that, they would kill for it. They took these small spaces also because it's so expensive to do it on your own. So we have the space. We did a very lovely website, but as I mentioned, the the Facebook page is going bananas, and uh, and one of the reason we're getting the fifty thousand plus likes so far is because we've accumulated so many unique things. While other Halls of Fame may just put in a, a photo of a hockey player hitting the, uh, the puck or a baseball player hitting the baseball, 
the stuff I've got on fighters, on women boxing, animals boxing, unique stories, kids in the ring, fighters falling out of the ring, the ESPN video library of Ali, Lewis, Dempsey, Marciano. For the past couple of months, we do a feature this day in boxing, whether it's a still photo or a fam famous fight video clip, people write in. And the funniest is when I put on a video on a, a certain fighter, let's say it's Ali, and I write an intro saying, how would Ali do against Mike Tyson? Take a look at Ali at his best. And yet guys writing in very comfortably, they say, you know, I like, I think Ali would win. And then another guy write in and say, well, I think Mike had a better jab. I think he'd win. Then the first guy write in, no, I don't think so. I think Ali. And the second guy says, no, no, you're wrong. It's Mike. And the first guy said, what the hell are you talking about? You know nothing. And the second guy says, well, screw you. You know nothing too. And then it builds up, builds up. And all of a sudden you have one guy talking about the other guy's mother. And it's the funniest stuff. They get so emotional about this. I'm sure it happens in baseball, football, basketball. I've never seen it. But because it's one guy against one guy, these boxing fans get so emotional, the, the conversations are almost hysterical. But that gives us a lot of viewers. That brings people to watch it, to listen to these guys, to look at what they have to say, to share the video, the photographs. So it's been a lot of fun. We've got so much great stuff on there that people just enjoy going back to, to look at it. Definitely. I mean, this, this, um, this the conversation right now, when, when I finish chopping it up, even on YouTube, yeah, like the, 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 how Ali Fur against Mike Tyson, that little segment that's there. If I cut it up, just put it out on YouTube, like you said, like it will just get like thousands of views. Like you right, the passionate fans will argue now. Maybe with Floyd, Floyd versus Big, anything to do with like boxing. Like people find it very personal and they they they're passionate about everything they have to say. I mean, what's the criteria for, to get into the Hall of Fame? Well, what I wanted to do. That's a good question. What I want to do is have a Hall of Fame that was only boxers. I didn't think that it was fair to the boxers to put in a, a spit bucket man or a trainer or a manager or promoter, because really, in the history of boxing, there's never been a promoter who made money for a fighter that couldn't fight. I could see, you know, if, 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 sugar, if a 20-year-old Sugar Ray Leonard came to you tomorrow and said, can you help me? You walk them right into the BBC, they'd lock the door. <laughs> they wouldn't let you out until they signed a contract. Yeah. But if, if a 20-year-old Tom Jenkins came to you, whose boxing record was 8-8, eight and eight, you couldn't do anything with the guy. Mm. Now, if a promoter was able to make millions of dollars for a guy 8-8, eight and eight, I'd say, holy mackerel, this guy, this promoter is great. That's never happened. So without a great fighter, it's been incredibly rare in the history of boxing that a promoter or manager or trainer did anything with a fighter who wasn't a fighter to begin with. In the really rare exceptions, I mean, the one that comes to mind, of course, was Customato and what he did for Tyson. Because from the very first day, he made something so unique and such an entertainer that it became something valuable. Valuable. With every other fighter, whether you name Duran or Ali, or Joe Frazier, every guy, every one of those guys is sensational. So there shouldn't be any manager or promoter in there unless they develop the fighter from, from an eight and eight record to a multimillionaire performer. That's never happened. Same thing with the trainer. You get these wonderful trainers, they're wonderful guys, but they never developed the, the Duran or the Ali or the Sugar Ray Leonard. They were there when the fighters walked in the door. So uh, for the Hall of Fame that we have, I, I try to, uh, get it to where we focus on the fighters. We got an incredible uh, group of advisory board members, historians, men, women who've been in the business for 50 years. They, the fighters they talk about are fighters I don't even remember, you know, from the turn of the century. So they know every fighter inside and out, and we put it to a vote. Should there be fighters only, or fighters, managers, promoters, and others? And the majority was only fighters. So that was number one. Then number two last year, I had them come up with their list. Everyone comes up with a list of the top 50 fighters, in their opinion, that should be in the Hall of Fame. And we, we combined all the lists. And the first 25 across the line, the first top 25, that was our first induction. So our first induction was 25 guys, the top on each one's list, 
averaged out. And of course, it's the, it's the ones you would imagine, you know, Ali and Robinson and Lewis and Dempsey Marciano, uh, you know, down the, down the line, Armstrong and Ross and Canzanari. Uh, this year, in about a month or so, we'll put out another list. We'll have someone, uh, we'll have each person come up with their list of 50 people, 50 fighters that they think should be in the Hall of Fame. Of the 20 people on the advisory board, we'll average out the top, this time maybe 10 or 15, and that's the group that'll go in. And uh, at some point, there'll be a, a point where the, the, the list will get slim because there's some fighters who are placed in other halls of fame that really don't belong in the hall of fame. And that's something that these people, they're very concerned about, is making the hall of fame very prestigious and making sure that there's no one in there that doesn't belong. And that's why we went with just the fighters. Mm, definitely. So you see the Hall of Fame because I'm I'm trying to understand now because there's a Hall of Fame recently where Arturo Gay and Sylvester Stallone got in. Is this the same Hall of Fame? No, uh, there's a good question. There are three Halls of Fame of boxing. Three, actually, two major ones, mm -hmm. and one a new another one here in, in Vegas. The one that's been up for quite some time is called the International. Boxing Hall of Fame oh, yeah. in upstate New York, yeah. and they've they've been up for about 20 years, and a lot of the inductions the inductions are done very well up there. They have a huge party, and they get a big crowd for that June weekend. Uh, but some of the press around the world have been a little unhappy with some of the inductions. Guys like Don King being put in there, and I don't see how anyone in the Hall of Fame could put Don King in a Boxing Hall of Fame. So they've been, and one of the things with our group is, of course, no promoters, managers, or uh, trainers. And but they've been up for a long time. I thought that our Hall of Fame, the Boxing Hall of Fame Las Vegas, which we have at the Luxor, could have a little better loyalty to the fighters, a little more prestige, prestige to the fighters. And that's what we've been doing. And the result is part of that is, of course, Facebook. We've got you know over 50,000 likes, and I think today there were about 3,200 people actually talking about us today on, 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 on the Facebook. The International Boxing Hall of Fame has 3,000 likes and about 100 people talking about them. We have more people talking about us than they have likes. And the reason is that I want to show the public every day these great fighters, what they did, the videos, this day in boxing. In the last week, I had Monzon and Briscoe on there. I had Tyson and, and um, uh, Vander Holyfield on there. I had this great fighter from the 50s and 60s, Florentino Fernandez on there. I had uh, Robinson and Dykes to film every day something else to make people see how great these guys were. Photos and everything. The other halls of fame don't do that. It's You just can't sit back and wait on an induction ceremony each year to keep you in the public eye. Also, some of the press were a little unhappy that Stallone was inducted up there. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's great to have him. He should have been a special guest. We'll have special guests at our induction when we plan that. We might have, I have some wonderful friends, uh, associates, who I asked to be the honorary board members. I needed people on an honorary board that would be very prestigious in the public eye. Number one on the list was Joe Lewis, Jr., I've met him a couple of times. He's the CEO of the World Golf Village. That's the Golf Hall of Fame down in Florida. I said, Joe, it would be an honor. He said, absolutely, yes. Then there's an actor named Ryan O'Neill who had done some wonderful movies. He was the boyfriend of Farrah Fawcett, boxing guy, crazy guy, boxing, loves boxing, knew Jose Torres. He said, absolutely, yes, Steve. Jerry Lewis, legendary comedian from the 50s and 60s, maniac boxing guy, knows every fighter, wants fight films that I forgot to even had, you know, and a young guy by the name of Ed O'Neill from Married with Children. He was a former boxer, football player. He did uh, plays on boxing. And uh, I asked him, would he be on the honorary board? Absolutely yes. So I could see them being part of the honorary board to support us, but not to be inducted. And what Canastota did was induct actors and actresses and other people, non-combatants, as they call them, that really in my mind, don't belong next to Joe Lewis and Jack Dempsey and Rocky Marciano. The fighters themselves, if they were alive, they'd say, fine, you know, that's no big deal, Steve, relax. I'm different. I'm saying, you know, you guys, they are too special. You know? So for us, it's just the fighters.
Oh, good. So, uh, is it? Uh, well, how would you say Arturo got Arturo Gatti got named in the Hall of Fame? Would he? Would he? Would he get into your Hall of Fame? That would be up to the advisory board mm. and their listing yeah. of the top fifty fighters each year. Would he be on a list eventually? Probably yes, because he's a sensational fighter. But there are fighters at the turn of the century that people forget that belong in there first, that had a persevere. Now, they may not have been as exciting as, as Arturo Gatti, but they were more deserved of being a legendary fighter. Mm. You know, the Sam McVeighs and the Joe Walcott, yes. the, Joe Walcott, the original Bar Barbados Demon, you know, Joe Gans, fighters like that, you know, uh, you know uh, Stanley Ketchell and McGovern and, and Gans and Nelson. You know, Sullivan and Kill Rain and Corbin and Tom Sharkey, those guys that were in the era that were the birth of boxing, from bare knuckles to gloves. And while people, most people, won't even know who they were, these advisory board members do know. And it's important to put them up there, too. Yes, Ali and Lewis and Dempsey, but these other fighters were, were sensational. What they had to persevere. Um, about a month ago, two months ago, there was a boxing convention uh, in Reno, Nevada. I'm in Las Vegas, and Reno's about 300 miles north of Las Vegas. And I wanted to drive there since I never really took a drive of that type. And driving there, you go to a couple of towns, one in particular named Goldfield, Nevada, and that's where uh, Joe Gans fought uh, uh, batting Nelson uh, in 1906. I don't even know how people got there <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. And on the films, the arena, the outdoor arena, is packed. It's got to be 4,000 guys at this place. And I, I had to drive there. It took three, three hours. And buddy is a, buddy, a, a buddy of mine who was a historian said, Steve, back then there were trains that went directly there, from probably from California. I said, how did they get there? It was over the mountains and everything. So that's what these guys had to persevere in the boondocks with no, no cars, no planes, by horseback, uh, in, in uh, trains, in these, getting there took days. So what the fighters had to endure, I don't want people to forget that because they were fantastic fighters fighting 20, 30, 40 round fights, you know. Mm. Uh, and the funny thing is, Mike and I, in 87, we met a gentleman who was very close with a very famous Hall of Fame called the Los Angeles Athletic Club Hall of Fame. And they had some wonderful stuff in there. And a couple of things were the Battling Nelson scrapbooks, these wonderful scrapbooks in the turn of the century from this fighter. And I was looking through it, and when Nelson fought uh, Walgast on these huge pages back in those days, the pages were twice the size of the newspapers today. It was in this binder, all perfectly done. And on one huge page of the San Francisco uh, Chronicle back then, the headline is, uh, Nelson says he'll win in 30. 30 rounds. The other page, Wargas says I'll stop him in 25. 25? <laughs> 25. Now, today, a guy will say, yeah, I think I'll stop him in four rounds. Back then, I'll win in 30. Yeah. I'll stop him in 25. That's That's, you know? yeah. And by the way, six ounce gloves and no mouthpieces. <laughs> That's, you know, can you imagine fighting Mike Tyson with a six ounce glove and no mouthpiece? That's brutal. So, you know, so, but that's the way these fight. They were so wonderful. And, you know, it, it's great. To, it's fortunate that we have these films of them to see from back then. It, it's really wonderful. Yeah, definitely. Do you see Joey Maxson? Is, it, is he in your Hall of Fame? No, not yet. No, okay. But hmm. I'm delighted you brought up Joey because that's another story yeah, that's yeah, really yeah. wonderful. In that, in 87. We're out here for the uh, Smith fight, and I heard that Joey Maxim was working at one of the hotels. It was the hotel called the casino called the Frontier Hotel. And I, I heard that he's working what they call, I think it's called the Big Six. It's the big wheel, the roulette wheel. And I heard he's working there. I said to Mike, hey, you want to go over and visit Joey Maxim? He said, oh, man, yeah. So we went to the hotel, Mike's heavyweight champ in the world, and we walk in. All of a sudden, the executives come down. They heard Mike's there. Walk up to the table, Joey Maxim. Joey couldn't believe that 
Mike Tyson, heavyweight champion of the world. And Mike has talked to them like, so Joey, man, you know, so when you fought Archie, what was that like? And when you fought Ray, you know, in, in, in the polo grounds and, and the fight was so hot and everything, you know, what happened? And the 110, and they're talking and talking. About an hour later, you know, we say, hey, Joey, it's great to see you, you know, and, and we leave. And we're in the car, and Mike says, man, can you imagine? I met Joey Maxim. I said to Mike, Mike. Of all the champions that have come out here for the last 15, 20 years, how many of them do you think went over to the hotel to say hello to Joey? He said, uh, he said I, I don't know. I said, none. Yeah. Can you imagine how he felt mm. for you, the heavyweight champion of the world, coming in? How do you think he looked at the executives knowing that you came there to see him? And Mike smiled. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, that's what he was like. Yeah, wow, boy. <laughs> uh, hey, man, I'm I'm been blown away. I'm blown away by these stories, Steve, man. I'm blown away, man. Like you're doing a fantastic job, man. And this Hall of Fame, I need to give bring credit back because to be honest with you, yeah. When I heard, I didn't. I'm glad your Hall of Fame is here. Was really, I, I didn't know because obviously I was thinking of the other Hall of Fame probably gets um was getting in the array, but your the Hall of Fame lost it in Las Vegas definitely man and that, that's what it needs that's what boxing needs and, and you know I, I love the footage the footage you keep putting up like I mean have you got any new footage you can tell for the the viewers listening in the UK and all over the world like any new footage you've got just, just recently got or you can tell to the people well there are a couple of things that are, that have been found recently uh, there was a Mickey Walker fight that was found against Mike McTeague every once in a while somebody in their attic finds a, in the garage, finds a reel of film. And they call around, they, they call ESPN and says, they say, I got this great reel of film. ESPN is really not that interested because they have Muhammad Ali and Joe Lewis, Jack Dempsey. They go online, they see our Hall of Fame Las Vegas, our Hall of Fame. They call me, I said, wow, I'd love to see that. And they said, Steve, you know, it's 35 millimeter nitrate film, which is something that hasn't been used in a half century. It's explosive. I said, well, you know, I have some labs that may be able to transfer it to safety film or, and then to video. They said, Steve, will send it to you. And I find labs that transfer it. And because I know that not only I get a kick out of being the first person in a hundred years to see the fight. Mm. That's happened once in a while. Uh, the first one was a fight about six years ago Frank Stallone is a huge boxing guy, the brother of Sylvester Stallone. Mm. And he found an incredibly rare reel of film. It was the only film ever of Abe Attell, this wonderful featherweight champion from the turn of the century, uh, where he loses the championship to a guy named uh, Johnny Kilbane. And it was never seen before. No films of Attell existed. And as I put it on my rewind, to look at it for the first time, these real crank things in my in my office back in New York, the film started to disintegrate, oh. started to fall apart. Oh. So I said, I, I better not touch it. I'm going to pack it up yeah. and send it to the lab. Mm. And the guy, this incredible master named Johnny Allen, yeah. uh, film lab, he was able to take this reel that was falling apart, make a beautiful 35 millimeter film negative from it, and then from the negative, I sent it to a lab to transfer to video it looks sensational so every once in a while like this walker mcteague it's only 45 seconds but it's a thrill to be able to see something that no one has seen in 60 or 70 years so that's one of the clips but the big fight of the day this day in history will be coming up in about 12 days that's a fight that's not a bad fight and it was pretty exciting and for me it was not that bad there was a guy, I think goes, who's the name of the guy? Oh, yeah, Mike Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> winning, winning the heavyweight championship against Trevor Burbick back in 86. Yeah. So on the 22nd of November, that'll be this day in history, we'll show Tyson Burbick back then. Yeah. Wow, man. Well, poor Steve, man, like, <laughs> I want to say, man, I like, really appreciate this interview. And, um, yeah, boy, like, keep up the good work. And, and you know, obviously, like, um, avid watch of your videos and, and on Facebook, and I'll keep I'll keep keep posting and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, man, I'll, I'll try and keep in touch with you as well, man. Um, so sure. you, you got anything to say to the people watching in the UK? Yeah, well, there's one a video that we'll have posting on soon. I won a few rounds with, with uh, Jennifer Lopez. And uh, it was a hell of a fight, and she smacked me around a little bit. So you'll be seeing that also. You really? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Are you just kidding? <laughs> uh, actually, if Jennifer hit me, I'd pay extra. 
<laughs> no, that I, I hope you keep tuning in. Tell your fans that we'll be keeping up this great stuff on there. We'll be showing these great legends, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted that people look at it. And the more response that the Hall of Fame uh, Facebook page gets, the more I like it. And I'm very appreciative of these boxing fans. Yeah, definitely. We appreciate it of, of, of the work you guys are putting out there. And my seventy eight. You want to say anything to Steve before we go? Oh, I just, hey, I just want to say I really enjoyed this conversation. This was a. Uh you know, I, I'm sitting down, drinking a beer right now, listening. You know, <laughs> this is a well, very good, good uh, boxing knowledge. So I appreciate it. Yeah. When do I get my check? <laughs> <laughs> it's in the post in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, hey, guys. Thank you so much. No, thank you as well, Steve. Man, we'll talk soon. Yeah, take care. Okay. Bye. Bye. Now. Bye.